Good morning to you all today. And I'm going to take a minute for us to kind of gather in, and we're having to do this a little bit different than what we anticipated, and it was only this morning that we realized that we were going to have to take this particular approach to this thing, and uh, that's okay. Uh, as Pastor said, uh, we're to be instant in season and out of season, and so here we are gathered with you today. It's a unique time. It's a different season, a different way of having church. But one of the things that we've come to realize is that our God is the same regardless of the day, the time, the era, the moment that we're living in. And he is an overcoming God. He is victorious. There is none like him. And I am very, very appreciative that he is our savior. He is our deliverer. He's our keeper. And uh, as I see people joining us today, we're, we're so glad that you're here and look forward to seeing many of you who are guests on this uh, online presentation. We look forward to seeing you in church. We look forward to you being part of Calvary. Many of you have unique gifts, abilities, and you know you have them that are intended to benefit others, and uh, you are to be part of the body of Christ. And so don't let this moment pass you by. Uh, as we move into our our service today. Let me mention a couple of things. Number one is uh, if you will share, that means that your, uh, your friends are made aware of what we're doing today and uh, they would likely be invited. You could also start a watch group that would uh, entice perhaps some of your friends. And I, as I understand it, you can actually interact within the group and uh, that is a good thing. Your comments for both what Pastor Butler did, and wasn't, wasn't that a great start for our morning? I'm so glad that the anchor holds for the people of God. I'm glad that the anchor holds in spite of the storm, in spite of the difficulties that come. The anchor truly holds. But uh, if you would uh, make comments there, if you will comment or ask questions perhaps on what I'm going to try to preach today, uh, it would be good. Now, I'm working with some lights, as I always do, but today we move so very quickly that uh, I'm probably going to be dealing with uh, some light reflecting off my eyeglasses, and that's always the biggest challenge in dealing with lights. That's the reason I usually don't use uh, lights or don't use my glasses while I'm trying to preach this way. So a share or a watch group would be beneficial. Now, as I begin to move into the text today, let me also remind you that Monday through Friday, I am teaching online beyond your crisis. Tomorrow, I will complete uh, the, I think it'll be three lesson series on uh, the role of speaking in tongues in the New Testament church, and then I'm going to begin teaching about the nature of God, that God is one God, and uh, that He is not uh, he is not part of several. He is not, uh, we do not worship a polytheistic God. We do not worship a tritheistic God. But here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, is still the profound truth that uh, is found in the Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's going to be more in-depth than some of the things that I've dealt with. So I look forward to your help in getting the word out on that. I noticed that one of the things that was in the last song that Pastor uh, Butler sang, was it talked about, I once was young, but now I'm old. And uh, it, it comes kind of to set the stage for uh, where I'm going to take you in the scripture today, which is going to be the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, written by, written by Solomon, and he uses an interesting word throughout it to talk about himself. He is the Kohelet, and uh, it means the preacher or the teacher. And uh, it, it seems obvious that, that Solomon is speaking from the perspective of years, that time has passed. He's no longer a teenager. He's no longer in his 20s or 30s. But he has come to a stage and a season of his life where that he knows some things about living, and he knows some things about what matters. And uh, there are many of you who are my age and older who you could write a book on things that, that you know now 
that you wish you had known when you were in your 20s or 30s or maybe even in your teens. So if you're a teenager, if you're a young adult, it's great to get close to some elders who can share with you and dispense to you the wisdom and the insight that they have gained through years of experience. And so that's kind of what Solomon is distilling down in this anointed book of Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes is really poetry, but it's interesting where he begins. He begins with, with vanity, all is vanity. And uh, the word vanity that he uses refers to something that is meaningless. And he's going to repeatedly describe things that have no meaning based on his experience. And again, I think that there are many of us who can use that exact word in reference to a significant part of our life. There are some of you that are now in your late 20s and early 30s, and you look back to the big parties that you went to and the wonderful times that you had with friends as, as you were a teen or maybe in your early 20s, and uh, now you realize that all of that was absolutely meaningless. He begins with vanity. He begins with meaningless. But then he ends with fear God, and keep his commandments. And uh, the term fear God is not simply to tremble before him, but it is instead to respect God, to put him in his proper place, and to keep his commandments, to follow what it is that he would have you to be and what he would have you to do. It's interesting that in Solomon's perspective, he is not writing from the vantage point of heaven, He's not writing from the perspective of eternity, but he makes this comment that it's under the sun that he is referencing. So he's talking about the normal experiences of the human life. He's talking about what you and I go through. He's not looking at it from the vantage point of God. He's looking at it from the same perspective that you and I look at life from. In this book, he has far more questions than answers. And uh, I can certainly relate to that today. I think many who are watching or will watch can relate to that. Uh, what is this that's going on around us? Why is this happening among us? When is there going to be some semblance of normal in our lives? And uh, for most of those questions, we don't have answers. And I think many of us are frustrated with the answers that we do get because that they come in so many different varieties and there's so many different shades of solution that are offered. But nothing seems to be definitive. It's as though we are walking on jello. Well, there's a particular portion of Scripture that I want to address and talk about in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and this becomes a summation of some of the things of Solomon's experience. He says that there is, and this is Ecclesiastes 3, 3 and 4, he says there is a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. So here comes this wise writer, this man of experience in life. And he records in this particular chapter, he records his summary, having observed life, and that is that there is a time. A time for what? Well, there's a time to kill, there's a time to heal, there's a time to break down, to build up, to weep, to laugh, to mourn, and to dance. And uh, this particular portion of Scripture is referenced, actually, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7, just before the Lord's ascension in to glory. Now, Solomon is writing this from the perspective of the human circumstance and the human condition. But it's God who is inspiring him to write. And as he writes, he is definitively speaking 
about God's way of operating in the human life. And God's way of operating in our life involves several distinct operations. He first breaks and then he builds. He first kills and then he makes alive. First he brings us to a yieldedness and a surrender of our past life and our past behavior and we recognize the ineffectiveness of that particular approach to life and then he opens our eyes to the discovery of beyond that. There is a time to kill what has been but there is a time to heal what shall be. There is a time to break down the yesterdays of life and there's a time to build up your tomorrows in life. There's a time to weep and yes there's a time to laugh and there's a season of mourning and there's a season in which we would dance. And I speak to someone today that your life is not as it should be with God. It's not as you would want it to be. But I would say to you on this Sunday that this is a season of salvation. This is a moment when you and I can be alerted to the reality of our circumstance. There is a time to kill. There is a time to heal. Well, it's important to realize that before there can be the healing, there is first of all the killing. Killing precedes the healing. And so the teacher is making this observation that there is no new life, there is no forward moving future until first of all there is this addressing of the past life. There is this dealing with yesterday and you can't move beyond what has been. And that's what so many want to do. They simply want to ignore all of the uh, foolish things of their past. They want to move beyond all of that and they simply want to hit a reset button that allows everything to be white clean, but that's not really the way it works. There has to begin, first of all, there has to begin, first of all, a spirit of repentance, a spirit of God, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. There has to be a breaking down. Our neighbor next to us is building a new home and and before they ever really uh, begin to build anything up, first there were uh, bits of heavy equipment out there and there were things that drilled into our Ozark rock as those of you who live here understand and uh, they had to pound away and they had to break some things up before they could build on that piece of property. Well the same is true in our lives. There has to be a breaking down before there can ever be this building up and if we were in uh, a collective group today and and the hundred or so of us who are watching right now, if we were just in one room, I, would, I, I could point out some people in that room who, when they came to God, what they had built and what they had created and what had been their life was just something that was, that, that was kind of chaos. It was a mess. And God doesn't build on chaos. Instead, he breaks down or he asks us to break down. And that's really the reality is that we have to break down. I think there's two references that can be applied spiritually in the text that we're applying to, and that is that weeping goes before laughter and mourning goes before dancing. I, I tried to think about the places where that fits in life, where that, where that someone weeps and then they laugh, where someone experiences uh, mourning and then they experience dancing. And the only real place that I can comprehend that is in our spiritual condition because we come to him and I have seen tears across the altar and, and, and altars that are wet with the tears of people who have been immoral, people who have been addicts, people who had been broken by their own decisions, and they left tears on the altar. But in a bit, there was rejoicing in their life, and there was a spirit of laughter that came to him. That can be your story. Today, as you repent, it could well be that there is this moment or this season of weeping 
weeping comes first, but then there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn. Lord, I wish I had done this earlier. I wish I had uh, committed my life. I wish I had turned my life around earlier. But all of that's in the yesterday. We have to leave that behind and we have to just simply tear it down. So many have experienced exactly what I'm talking about. Exactly what I'm talking about. And, and, and you're, not, you're not any worse and your bad decisions of life are not any worse than Simon Peter. Simon Peter had something on uh, some of us, perhaps. He had been an intimate associate with the Lord. He had traveled with him. He had listened to him. He had given revelation concerning him. And uh, Simon Peter, he gets into this judgment hall where Jesus is being assessed and evaluated by the Jewish leaders. And in that judgment hall, there was a fire burning. And uh, Simon Peter stood there warming his hands at that fire. And a little servant girl came by and said, you're one of them. And I'm paraphrasing. Well, you're one of them. You belong with them. You're part of that group. And he repeatedly and most adamantly, even with the language of a curse, taking the name of the Lord in vain, he said, I'm not one of them. But it's only moments before Simon Peter is caught within the framework of his own failure. And the Bible says that he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter can never be the writer of those epistles. He can never be the preacher in Cornelius' house. He can never be the man used of God in the launching of the New Testament church unless there is he went out and wept bitterly, weeping, weeping, and then laughter. Paul was the chiefest of persecutors of the Christians, and he wrote to one of his uh, church groups that he had founded that I am the chiefest of sinners, worst of sinners. I've had people just even the last while say to me, Pastor, I would come to church, but if I came, the, the, the roof would fall in. Well, no, you're not the chiefest of sinners. You may have been the meanest and the biggest and the baddest on your block, but you're not the chiefest of sinners. Paul claimed that for himself. But on that Damascus road, on that Damascus road, as he's walking or as he's traveling to another city to again persecute additional Christians and arrest them and throw them into prison, he sees a great light from heaven. And in a conversation between him himself and the invisible presence in the heavens, he comes to this conclusion, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer comes, I am Jesus who you persecute. And that voice tells him where he is to go and what he's to do from that point forward. There has to be the tearing down before there can be the building up. It has to be that way. It's an interesting observation that Hannah makes, and it comes in an interesting place in time when she is bringing her child to give him over to God. And she walks in, and as she had done in prompting the Lord to bless her with a baby, she came into prayer as she is bringing Samuel to offer him. And she makes this statement. She says, The Lord killeth and maketh a line. He brings down to the grave and he bringeth up. But he begin, she begins with this observation that there is none holy like to our Lord. None holy like our Lord. There is none set apart like him. There is none that uh, we could serve that's like him. There is no experience we can have. There's no God like our God. What an incredible testimony that is. When you get to the New Testament, the great word of the New Testament is 
quicken. It means to make a lot. There is a time to kill. There's a time to make alive. There's a time to tear down. There's a time to build up. And our God is a God who doesn't leave us just with death, and he doesn't just leave us with the debris of what happened in the past, but instead he builds up, he builds up, he builds up, he builds up. Hallelujah. The best life. Listen to me. Some of you are young people that I pastored in yesterday, and you've made terrible choices, and you've made bad decisions in your life, but I want you to hear me. And this is pretty straightforward, but the best life you'll have for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 60, 70, whatever it might be, is giving your life to God and letting Him build you up in what He wants you to be and what He wants you to become. Of the ruins of your yesterday, there can be a palace for tomorrow. (laughs) in the death of all of your past relationships that have not worked. There can be a new life that begins. You can have what you have never had in God. There are seasons in God's hands. We never talk of healing till we first talk of Him killing. We never think of being built up. And first of all, there is a tearing down. You'll never experience the laughter until you find an altar on which to weep. And you will never have an equivalent of David's dance until you have learned to mourn. A season. We recognize that in our society today, we're living in a season such as none of us have ever known. But this is a season of salvation. To our backsliders, it's a season for you to kneel before the Lord and say, God, I'm yours from this day forward. To young people who were raised with truth and righteousness in their life, it's a time for you to say, God, I've tried all of the rest. And I would pose a question to you, has all the rest worked for you? Has money worked? Have relationships worked? Have bouncing from here to there? Has any of that worked? If it hasn't worked, why not try something different? Why not listen to not just this preacher, but why not listen to Solomon, the preacher, the coilet, and receive what he has to say? In the book of Acts, and I hasten because I've taken too much of your time already, In the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, there's a Philippian jailer who had been an attendant for Paul and Silas, and he has put them in the deepest of the prison, and he's put them in stocks, and and, uh, he has mistreated them. He is unkind. He's ungracious, as perhaps would happen in that particular culture and setting. But Paul and Silas have a prayer meeting and a praise meeting. And in the prayer meeting and the praise meeting, There was an earthquake of change that came. And in that moment, and in that moment, that Philippian jailer who had been so mean and so violent and so abusive, he discovers that he is at risk and he determines to put himself physically to death. He is about to commit suicide. And Paul says, wait a minute, we're all still here. Don't put yourself to death. And uh, the man comes to him and says, what must I do to be saved? And I paraphrase it. What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas sat down with him and they begin to explain to him Jesus and the, Jesus was the Christ, the, the Messiah. He had no understanding of Messiah. They, they had to take some time to explain that to him. Just as there are people who will watch this who have no understanding really of the place that Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, that there's, there's, there's nothing that lives within you that is carnal and worldly and of the flesh that he can't do a work and he can't take that 
from your life. That's powerful. That is an incredible premise. If you will tear down that Philippian jailer at the end of the day had to put himself to death, not physically, but he had to spiritually and mentally and emotionally repent and put himself to death. When he had repented, he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And there was an awakening. There was a desire in him for something that would transform, something that would be different. That is what so many of you, and I'm thankful for the responses. I've seen several of you who are longtime acquaintances, and I don't get to see you much anymore. But you're at a point in your life where there is a change brewing. You need to raise your children living for God. You need to raise them doing right. You need to make whatever sacrifice. You, you do it for them to be part of rodeo. You do it for them to be part of drama at school. You do it in order for them to make good grades. You need to do it in order for them to be raised in, what was it Solomon called it, the fear of the Lord. Because if you don't respect God, if they don't see that in you, they'll never respect God themselves. So there's a revival in families. There's a revival in moms and dads. There's a revival even in grandparents that's going to sweep across Greene County and across neighboring counties and impact people who are far, far removed from God's will in their life. Now, I don't have any little tricky way to wrap this up today to give you a time where that we can kind of hang out together. But what I need you to do is if God's spoken to you as you've listened today, I'm asking that you would just find yourself a quiet place and you may have to move away from your family or whoever else you're with and you may need to just kneel in your bedroom or in an office or somewhere else. You, you need to kneel. And you need to say, God, I'm sorry. I want, I want there to be a death to my old life. I'm tired of living the way I've lived. I want something fresh and, and I need God to tear down what has been because what has been is not beautiful and it's not precious and there's nothing here but wood and stubble. There's nothing of lasting significance. But starting today, there can be a brand new beginning as God builds your life into a palace of praise. God builds your life into a palace of serving Him. Tear down the old man, yes, and let God build a new man. He will make you alive by the power of the Spirit of God. If you need Pastor Butler and I to pray with you, uh, our numbers are available. It's there on the Facebook page. It will forward to one or the other of us. If you need counsel in this difficult time, we're there for you. I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you today. And you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. And I have felt your anointing touch. I felt it in Pastor Butler's singing and leading us in a time of praise and worship. I felt it perhaps like I have never felt it in looking straight into a camera and preaching. So God, you, you knew who would be in this audience today. You know who it is that their testimony to this point is nothing has been torn down and nothing has been killed. They've simply lived for themselves and to do their own thing and, and to satisfy their own ambitions and desires and, and lusts and longing and never put any of that in restraint. You know who, you know what, you know why. But God, this is a season yes, to tear down, but to let you begin to build up. I'm appealing to you for a move of the Holy Ghost that sweeps beyond where I stand just now and reaches out into this community and goes into homes and byways that I can't begin to get to with ingenuity or ability or anything else. Let the Spirit of God fall in a powerful way I worship and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you'd like to repent, we can help. If you'd like to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can get access to a baptistry. I'm so glad that you became part of our service today. I have, if I were in a room with you, I would begin to call names because I've watched them as they've come across the screen and some that are friends of many years that have never heard me preach. Others that I pastored, some that I dedicated you as babies. God's doing a work in your life. Let Him, let Him obey His Word, live it. If you're interested in a personal Bible study, we have people who are equipped to teach and they would love to spend some time with you, even using FaceTime in the Word of God. Tomorrow, 10 o'clock, I will be teaching and we'll be working again through Beyond Your Crisis. Today, somebody needs to send us a note saying, the Holy Ghost touched me. While I was praying, I began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. Love you. God bless. And I will see you in the morning if you can be there at all. Love you.